Okay, thank you very much for uh, coming back in so quickly. We really appreciate uh, the speed at which people are moving from one location to the other. And this is our last session of the day, uh, so we'll move along because I know a number of you um, have been here since early this morning. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity uh, to welcome um, our last set of speakers. Um, so first up, we have... Uh, double act, like we've had a few times today. Um, uh, our first person is Professor Carolyn Jenkins, and we welcome Carolyn, who has made the journey all the way from South Carolina to be with us today. Um, Carolyn is a, a professor of uh, nursing at the Medical University in South Carolina, and over her 30-year career in academia and in research, she has done um, outstanding work, working in particular with uh, black African communities um, and other underprivileged groups in her area, um, working to promote better health outcomes. And Carolyn is going to talk to us today about uh, the work she has done here and particularly about her work in building partnerships between academic and community organisations. And Carolyn will be followed then by Sharon Conway. And Sharon has spent some time in South Carolina but really belongs here. And Carolyn is the um, um, programme coordinator of the Irish pilot of uh, the uh, programme that originated in South Carolina and also works in the clinical research facility here in Galway. So without further ado, Carolyn, we'll hand over to you. Okay, well, thank you. And it's a real privilege to be here. I certainly am saying to folks, I understand why Ireland is known as the Emerald Isle. Uh, it's beautiful and, and green. When we're talking about community-engaged research, what we're talking about when we say community is a geographic community, an online community, a group of patients, a group of researchers, a group of providers, or even a group of institutions working together can be labeled as a community. So with community engaged research, it's a continuum, beginning first with outreach, all the way through to collaboration and shared leadership. So the focus of our community engaged research program or community engaged scholars is really about collaboration and shared leadership. So successful community engaged research really involves this commitment to long-term community investment. It's not simply walking in a community, beginning the research, leaving at the end of the research funding. It's a long-term relationship that we build. And both the community and the researchers need to be open to organizational and cultural change. And earlier I shared just one of many interventions that we've been able to change at the medical university because it really requires systems change to be successful with community engaged research, as well as a willingness to share power between both the academic and the community researchers and the development of trust and respect. And we talk about trust and respect by saying, put the issues on the table that we have with each other, rather than underneath the table and not talking about them, not sharing them, not resolving them. It just becomes very important to discuss those. With our Community Engaged Scholars Program, and Sharon was at the university when this began, uh, was first begun in 09, and we are in our ninth cohort of, of trained researchers of either two or six different projects each year. It depends on the quality of the projects and the research funding that's available. So with research with the community, we define it typically as in our community engaged scholars program, 
as community-based participatory research that optimizes community engagement with the formation of partnerships between the communities and the academic organizations. It's a new process for many researchers to, to listen to the community, to have the community generate a question of interest to the community to do the research. And it is often a struggle because we have different knowledge bases, we have different skills, different resources, and we have different ideas in the leadership and ownership. So with community-based participatory research and the Community Engaged Scholars Program, the community and the academic member actually own the data. And each are involved in each step of the process. And you may say, well, gee, you know, with statistics, how do we expect the community member to interpret? If we communicate, we, had, we actually had a group of people dealing with end-of-life issues in a very under-resourced community, low educational level, and it was fascinating as they presented the findings back to 240 people in their community to listen to them talk about p-values. You would never think that someone without a high school degree could do this, but they were able to do it because we communicated. We learned from each other. So the purpose of the Community Engaged Scholars Program is really to increase the capacity of the academic community partnerships and to have that mutual ownership and understanding and then ultimately to make improvements in the health of our communities. And South Carolina, out of the 50, count, of the 50 states, we are generally in the bottom five as far as health outcomes are concerned. So that's a real challenge for us. And we were one of the first initiatives in the US to actually provide simultaneous training to the community and the academic researcher for a particular project. And it was started with six different groups. We generally now have two to three because of funding issues. And we actually found that it is an effective mechanism for training the two together. So what are our goals? To incentivize and to foster the community or the patient groups and the academic partnerships to encourage collaborative identification of community health issues. So I, as a researcher, don't go into the community and say, I'm going to do this research on you and I want you to participate. It's a decision that's collaboratively made. And then we learn together in a, a, a set curriculum that each year is based on a needs assessment for the participants. It provides equitable and hopefully lasting partnerships. Some have now been in partnership for, for nine years. And one of the first groups uh, just got a multi-million dollar grant uh, to study Alzheimer's. Um, and it started with our Community Engaged Scholars Program. And, and so we work with the groups to continue to, to develop their research. And, and we've been relatively successful with that. Here you'll see some of the competencies that are listed, and I certainly won't read them. But one of the things that we're doing now is, is saying to, to the participants, what's your goal? in five years where do you want to be and and then we look at how to 
develop that goal, sometimes it's practical, sometimes it's impossible. And so we look at adjusting it. Sometimes it becomes a 10-year goal rather than a five-year goal. The initial evaluation framework you see listed here, uh, and I'll point out the, the, um, the evaluation process is based on the REAIM model, that is the, the reach, effectiveness, um, the adoption, and the implementation, and then the maintenance. So we look at those very carefully and plan for those as we go through the process. So what's our application process? First, we send out a call for requests for applications, and initially it was in the university. Now it spans the whole state. And, and so we provide an informational call that's recorded and placed on our website so that people can ask questions. And then as people ask questions, the answers are, are posted so that all applicants can have access to equal information. And here you see the list of the components um, we do have supervisor approval because uh, it's important that if a community group is participating, that the lead of that group has signed off and says, yes, this is okay, this is a good research question. So the supervisor provides consent forms and then we have a signed memorandum of agreement between the researcher and the community uh, researcher, as well as within the university. And this was a change that we had to make uh, to really set up that equal partnership, rather than the university say, this is what you as the community group will say. We were very clear, this is what the university is responsible for, this is what the community is responsible for, and this is the way we're going to work together. And we use a very similar system that I've heard talked about today uh, with the selection of the CESP applicants. All the grants are reviewed according to our National Institute of Health nine-point scale. And we, the one thing that we do add is the partnership capacity. We don't require that it be an experienced partnership, it can be a new partnership, but we do a capacity assessment related to that partnership. And so both community and um, academic members review all have some experience in community engaged research. Then the training, once they're selected, the training process begins. And we have 10 to 15 weekly 90 minute sessions. Um, we are moving this past year to an online program and being able to uh, connect with universities and community groups across the state so that, that the applicants who are selected don't have to come to the university. They can join online. Each group has a mentor that is, is collaboratively decided between the team and the CESP leadership based on a needs assessment that we do. Um, and sometimes it's multiple mentors. And then the, the pilot grant proposal development is refined and once they complete the training, the funding begins after ethical approval. And, and so, we, we have this co-ownership, the didactic training and the pilot funding. Um, and the partners you see develop the project, 
they submit the application, they are co-principal investigators and are expected to have equitable input and benefits from this. And then the didactic training and the pilot grants. Now we're replicating this also in Delaware and the pilot grants there are $20,000. And then at uh, Howard University in, in the DC area, the pilot grants are actually 25,000. So we've replicated it in about five universities. Here you see the formal curriculum training um, and with the, the data collection, data analysis, we do both qualitative, quantitative training for that, again, based on the plans that are from the CESP applicants. We have a multidisciplinary team that comes in and, and works with us on the training as well as CESP alumni. We use a toolkit called the Are You Ready Toolkit that we'll talk about tomorrow uh, with some of the groups. And this really helps the community take a look, that is the academic and, and community groups, take a look at how to determine, are you really ready to start this research project? or do other activities need to occur? Other discussions need to occur before you start the project. And we work through this toolkit over the period of the CESP curriculum. And the toolkit is based on a framework that is evidence-based. It's a goodness of fit between the academic and community researchers as well as the capacity to do the research, is there additional competencies that need to be developed, are the resources there, and then the day-to-day -day operations of doing the research. And I heard someone talk about the principles of partnership. I could not agree more that those are so important, as well as how are you going to resolve conflicts? because if you wait until a conflict occurs, there's too much emotion to resolve it then. The method for resolving conflicts needs to be ahead of the conflict. And so what are our outcomes? Um, since 09, we've trained nine cohorts, 30 team members, I mean, 30 teams, 82 members, uh, and 50% of the participants were uh, community members. Um, we've trained uh, groups that work in 10 different cities or towns, both in urban and rural, and a variety of different community members as well as a variety of different universities. Uh, these are all the major universities that are state supported in South Carolina and you see the different professions here. Um, and just an example of some of the, the CESP studies, you can see the, the different variety. One of the latest ones is reducing post-traumatic stress syndrome through surfing. And they actually are, are with the surfing group, uh, out collecting data as, as the veterans are engaging in their surfing activities. And they found that it's a very good place that is lower stress for the veterans versus sitting in a group. Um, so this is based on cohorts one through five. We've had a $46 uh, return for every dollar that we've invested. The new analysis is almost completed, but our preliminary data is we will have $52 
in return in grants into the community for every dollar that we've invested. And here you see some of the diversity of the groups, young, old, different racial and ethnic groups. And so I would close by saying to you, could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through the eyes or through each other's eyes for an instant and really see what we can do as a community. That is the academic and community members coming together and working as a community of researchers. So I always like Henry David Thoreau and I thought uh, certainly he makes a great quote there that we could think about. And I'd like to acknowledge our uh, National um, Institute of Health Clinical and Translational Science Award that provides the funding for this and then the initial work that was funded through a DOD U.S. Army grant. So thank you and questions. Or maybe Sharon, we'll do questions after you finish.